right then if we get started. Uh, so good afternoon everyone. Um, just a flag that this webinar will be recorded and we'll share the recording with everybody afterwards. And I'm Hannah Pettit, so I'm an associate in the commercial team at Ashford's and specialising in data protection. And I'm joined today by Rachel Barnett from our employment team, uh, who also specialises in data protection, but particularly in the employment context. So that we can keep the webinar to 30 minutes, we won't be doing a live Q&A, but do feel free to send us over any questions you've got via email and we can pick those up with you separately. So today we're going to be looking at privacy considerations for workplace monitoring. I'll start by giving you a quick introduction on workplace monitoring and what that is. Rachel will then explore the legal framework governing workplace monitoring. And then I'll finish by working through a few specific examples of workplace monitoring from monitoring communications such as emails to video surveillance. So what is workplace monitoring? Now, this is any kind of monitoring of people that are carrying out work on your behalf. A few key examples are going to be things like CCTV and video surveillance, productivity monitoring software, which logs how employees spend their time, potentially email or internet activity monitoring. Um, and one that's sort of more common um, we're sort of seeing at the moment is office occupancy tracking. So people tracking when people are attending the office um, and sort of seeing how much time they're spending in the office compared to working from home and also GPS tracking devices. So these could be attached to potentially work vehicles or even personal devices. Now, in recent years, we've seen a huge increase in remote working and also an increase in technologies available to monitor the workforce. So it means that there's significantly greater scope for workplace monitoring than there used to be. Now, the ICO has recently published some guidance to help employers ensure that any workplace monitoring is lawful. And as part of this, they've carried out some research into employee perceptions of workplace monitoring. Now, interestingly, this research showed that only 19% of people believed that they'd been monitored um, by an employer. 70% said that they would find monitoring the workplace intrusive, so a really significant percentage there. And again, only 19% would feel comfortable taking a new job if they knew that their employer would be monitoring them. Now, this really highlights the importance of ensuring that any workplace monitoring you carry out is lawful, fair and transparent. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who's going to explain a little bit more about how you achieve lawful, fair and transparent workplace monitoring. Thanks, Hannah. So, yes, as Hannah mentioned, I'm going to take you briefly through the legal principles which apply to employee monitoring. I think at the outset, um, what we should say is that there is no specific piece of legislation in the UK which directly governs the monitoring of employees. Um, employers aren't expressly permitted by any legislation to monitor, but nor are they prevented from doing so. Instead, there are a number of legal frameworks which have developed over the years and which are applicable to the area of employee monitoring. And these include the European Convention on Human Rights and specifically Article 8, which provides individuals with the right to respect for private and family life. Um, the Investigatory Powers Act 2016, which is a piece, piece of legislation which governs the interception of electronic communications. Um, but finally, and what we'll be focusing on today, of course, the data protection legislation, because employee monitoring, of course, inherently involves the processing of personal data. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar, but the area of data protection is regulated by the General Data Protection Regulation or the GDPR, as well as the Data Protection Act 2018. So if we move on to the first of my slides here, then we are looking. First of all, I thought it would be helpful to briefly touch upon the seven data protection principles which are set out in Article 5 of the UK GDPR and which apply to the processing of all personal data, including employee monitoring. So I'll just go through these briefly just to touch on them because that's something we have to keep in mind at all times. So firstly, the principle of lawfulness, fairness and transparency, which is um, uh, these are terms that we use a lot and Hannah's already, already used them as well. And uh, the ICA monitoring guidance um, specifically notes that fairness is a key data protection concept. And in the context of employing uh, of monitoring workers means that an employer should only monitor in ways that workers would reasonably expect and not in ways that cause them unjustified adverse effects. Um, in terms of lawfulness and transparency, I'll come on into those points in a bit more detail shortly. 
Uh, the other sort of key principles we've got here, purpose limitations, so that personal data should only be collected for specific legitimate purposes, and data minimization, so the data that is processed or collected must be adequate, relevant, and not excessive in relation to the purpose for which it is being processed. Accuracy, of course, is pretty self-explanatory, but also includes that data should be kept up to date. Storage limitations, so data shouldn't be kept for any longer than is necessary. Integrity and confidentiality, which really means that appropriate security measures should be taken um, to account for any risks that might arise from the processing of personal data. And finally, accountability. Um, by employers or processes, which again is, is self-explanatory. So these are just the key principles that we always need to have in the back of our minds when we are considering employee monitoring. The next point I wanted to move on to is in the next slide, um, what is the lawful basis for monitoring? So this is the really the first key step that you need to consider if you are introducing employee monitoring of any kind. And that is to consider what your lawful grounds for processing employees' data in order to monitor them will be. Now, the lawful grounds for processing are set out in Article 6 of the GDPR, and which ground is appropriate to rely on will depend on the specific purpose and the context for the monitoring. Um, but I've set out the law potentially potential lawful grounds here, um, and I'll just uh, run through them briefly. So consent, the principle here is that consent, if you're relying on this as a lawful ground for your monitoring, it, the consent must be freely given, unambiguous, and include an affirmative action by the employee or the worker. And the, the key point here really is that consent is not usually appropriate in the employment context because of the imbalance of power between an employer and its workers. Um, it's generally assumed that because of that imbalance of power, consent is never really freely given. Um, in the context of employee monitoring, it will only be appropriate if workers, if an employer can demonstrate that workers have a genuine choice and control over the monitoring that is being carried out. Contract, so you might be able to rely on this lawful, lawful ground for processing if the employee monitoring is necessary for the performance of the contract. But in fact, the ICA monitoring guidance suggests that it is hard to envisage scenarios in which the use of employee monitoring is going to be the only way for the employer to fulfil its side of a contract, suggesting that that's probably going to be often a difficult ground to rely on in an employee monitoring context. It may be that you would be able to rely on a legal obligation. So there may be situations where employee monitoring is necessary in order to comply with a, a common law or a statutory obligation, in which case that lawful ground might apply. Uh, vital interests will have only very limited scope. It would generally only apply to matters of life and death. Um, so I will not dwell on that one too much. Now, if you're a public sector organisation, it's possible that you might be able to rely on the lawful ground of public task. So this is relevant for any organisation that exercises an official authority or carries out tasks in the public interest that have a clear basis in law. So if your employee monitoring is necessary for the performance of the public task that you're carrying out, then it's possible you could rely on this ground. But by far the most um, useful ground, and I think uh, the most utilised one would be that of legitimate interests, because this is the most flexible ground for um, potentially processing data. And this will apply where process, the processing is necessary for the employer's legitimate interests or those of a third party, unless the risk to the workers' rights override those interests. So essentially, employers need to be carrying out a bit of a three-part test when, when balancing the legitimate interests as against the rights of their workers. So first of all, is there a leg legitimate interest behind the processing and what is it? Is the processing necessary for that purpose? And thirdly, is the legitimate interest overridden by the person's own interests, rights or freedoms? And I just put a note here at the bottom of the slide, because often when it comes to employee monitoring, um, the employer might be processing special category data, we call it. So, uh, for example, biometric data is a type of special category data. And if you're processing special category data like this as part of your employee monitoring, then a special category condition for processing will also need to be met. Um, some examples of, of the sorts of special category conditions you might be able to rely on. Firstly, explicit consent. So very similar to the idea of the lawful ground of consent mentioned already. And again, the, the difficulty is that generally 
consent shouldn't be relied on in employment circumstances due to the imbalance of power between employer and worker. The ICO guidance does, however, suggest that if a feasible alternative to the employee monitoring in, in question is being offered to any workers who withhold their explicit consent, and that alternative does not negatively impact them, then the employer might be able to rely on consent as their condition for processing still. Uh, but Hannah will actually go into a bit more detail about this area in the context of a specific example shortly. Um, so that'll be interesting to explore that a bit further. Secondly, employment law rights and obligations is a potential special category condition that can be relied upon. So, for example, if your monitoring is to promote the health and safety of your workers, um, but you should always be able to point to a specific legal provision and should always have an appropriate policy document in place as well. Um, and another potential one is substantial public interest, and there are various um, public interest conditions in the legislation which, which could apply. So that's just briefly to touch on the important step of identifying a lawful ground and potentially a special category condition as well for carrying out your employee monitoring. The next key principle I wanted to touch on in my next slide is that of um, transparency. So this is really a key um, concept underpinning um, data protection legislation. Um, and what it, it's you know pretty self-explanatory, but you should always inform, employers should always inform their workers about any monitoring in an easily comprehensible and accessible way. And there will only be very exceptional circumstances where covert monitoring can be justified. So usually um, the, this transparency element can be met, met by way of a privacy notice, but we would also recommend this is done through use of policies and proactive communication to employees, such as through staff meetings, for example, or the use of posters around the workplace. Um, and so going on to my next slide and the next key um, element of this employee monitoring process, is to document the decisions that have been made with regard to employee monitoring. So in fact, the GDPR requires employers to undertake a data protection impact assessment or a DPIA to assess the necessity and the proportionality of any data processing activities they are planning to undertake, if particularly where they're planning to bring in a new process or system, which is likely to pose a high risk to workers' rights and freedoms. So employee monitoring will often trigger the need for a DPIA to be undertaken. And, and in fact, the ICO guidance on employee monitoring confirms that despite there not being a strict legal need to, employers should carry out a DPIA, even if, where they don't consider that there is a high risk to workers' rights and freedoms, on the basis that it can still assist with responsible decision making. And in fact, the guidance goes even further to state that if an employer decides to implement monitoring without carrying out a DPIA, then the employer should document its decision not to carry one out. So just really flagging the importance of this, this assessment, this data protection impact assessment, really. And I've put in the slide here what the DPIA should cover. So it should specify the purpose of behind the monitoring identify any potential adverse impacts of the monitoring and any measures which will be taken to mitigate those risks, consider whether there are any alternative, less intrusive methods to the type of monitoring which is being proposed. And again, um, Hannah will come on to a useful example of putting that sort of element of proportionality into context. Um, it should acknowledge the legal obligations which apply to monitoring, such as identifying the lawful basis, like we've already been through, and the special category condition, if necessary, for processing the data. And then ultimately, the DPIA should make a finding about whether the monitoring is justifiable in the circumstances. So why is it important to get it right, which is my final slide here. Um, and I think there are sort of two angles to this. From a data protection perspective, there are a range of penalties and fines which can be imposed on an employer, excuse me, <clears throat> if they haven't complied with the legislation. But I also think it's important to look at it from an employment perspective because following the data protection principles and the ICO guidance will always play an important role in mitigating the risk of statutory or contractual employment claims, which could otherwise arise from the manner in which any employee monitoring is carried out or how the how, how the data that has been obtained has been used. Uh, monitoring of employees in breach of data protection principles 
could breach the duty of trust and confidence, which is implied into an employee's contract of employment, which in turn could give rise to grievances and or constructive unfair dismissal claims. And there could also often be an overlap between the monitoring of employees and potential discrimination claims. So, for example, the monitoring of an employee's work performance or absences from work might give rise to disability discrimination issues. And if an employer had been carrying out employee monitoring in a way which breaches an employee's privacy and data rights, that in itself could amount to an act of disability discrimination with you know, significant risks attached. And I think finally, in my view, employment tribunals may also be reluctant to place a lot of weight on evidence that an employer has obtained from monitoring, which is carried out in breach of data protection principles. And at the very least, it won't serve to portray the employer in a, in a particularly positive light from the employer's employment tribunal's perspective if these principles haven't been adhered to. So it's for all those reasons, really, that being being sure of your lawful basis for carrying out the monitoring, communicating it to employees transparently, and carrying out your DPIA as well to ensure you've assessed the necessity and proportionality of the monitoring is really important. So now I'm going to hand back to Hannah to put some of these principles into practice and look at um, some examples of different types of monitoring in the workplace. Thanks, Rachel. So I mentioned a few key examples of monitoring at the start of the session, but I now wanted to explore those in a little bit more detail. So the first example I'm going to look at is fingerprint scanning. And this is often used in the context of clocking in and out of shifts. So these systems are most often used, I would say, within the hospitality and also the leisure industry. And that's where you've got a large number of employees that are potentially working different shifts. Um, and that may be paid on an hourly rate basis. So the employer wants to keep track of when people are arriving and departing from work. Now, fingerprint scanning is an example of biometric data that's being processed for the purpose of individually identifying someone. And so it's special category data. And it's a particularly high risk form of employee monitoring that needs to be really carefully considered. So the first step will always be to complete a data protection impact assessment. And as part of this, you document your processing risks and also the measures you're going to put in place to mitigate those risks. But you'll also identify your lawful basis. And because we're talking about biometric data used to identify somebody, you'll also need to document your special category processing condition. Now, Rachel touched upon the challenges with relying on consent in an employment context, and that's that imbalance of bargaining power between the employer and the employee. But actually, in this sort of scenario where you're looking at using biometric data to identify somebody um, and you're looking to use a fingerprint scanning technology, actually explicit consent is likely to be the only option available. And the ICO guidance on workplace monitoring suggests that if you can provide an alternative, such as clocking in with a swipe card, rather than forcing an employee to clock in with a fingerprint, then this could be helpful to demonstrate that employees actually do have free choice in that employment context. Um, but it's not just a simple case of saying, OK, we're going to roll out fingerprint scanning technology, um, offer an alternative of, say, a swipe card, and then this means that fingerprint scanning is acceptable. And that's because there's a lot of wider considerations to think about when using biometric data. And all of these need to be assessed as part of the process for completing a data protection impact assessment. So a really significant one that I wanted to touch on today is the significant risk of harm to individuals in the event that there is a security breach. So if a security breach happens and say passwords are leaked, these can be easily reset, but you can't reset a fingerprint. And this is why the security risks are going to be a really important factor in any decision to use biometric data such as fingerprint scanning. Now, when you complete the data protection impact assessment, if you can't satisfy yourself that you can implement sufficient mitigating measures so that the end risk level is acceptable, you shouldn't be proceeding with that processing. So a key question that you're going to need to ask yourself throughout that data protection impact assessment process is, whether there are any other less intrusive ways of achieving the same goal. Now, as we touched on earlier, swipe cards could be offered as an alternative. Um, but ultimately, because we can offer swipe cards as an alternative, you know, why don't we then use swipe cards for everybody? And this would be a far less intrusive option than requiring people to use biometric data to clock in and out of work. Um, so the conclusion here being that 
actually, if there is this plausible alternative, it's going to be much harder to show that that fingerprint scanning is necessary and proportionate in the context. Now, helpfully, we have actually got a real life example here. And that's because in February of this year, the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, issued an enforcement notice to Circo Leisure. Now, the ICO ordered Circo Leisure to stop using fingerprint scanners and also facial recognition technology for employees to clock in and out of work. And the two key factors for this decision were that A, employees weren't offered a clear alternative to the fingerprint or facial recognition scanning. So, for example, they weren't offered swipe cards. And secondly, they failed to show why it was necessary or proportionate to use that facial recognition technology and fingerprint scanning when there are less intrusive means available. So those identification cards or FOBs that we've mentioned. Now, this really demonstrates the challenges with justifying use of any biometric data when an alternative option is available. Now, for the next example, I wanted to have a look at email monitoring. Now, hopefully this example is going to be relevant for a lot of industries and it's going to be for anyone where the workforce communicate either internally or externally using emails or any other messaging systems. So if we take the example of an employer that has concerns about commercially sensitive information being disclosed by its employees on an unauthorised basis, so they decide that they want to roll out email monitoring to identify where that data leak is happening. Now, what are the key considerations for this employer? So firstly, must complete a data protection impact assessment to document the processing risks and how they're going to mitigate those. And as part of that data protection impact assessment, it would be really important for them to consider whether it's possible for them to monitor network data to start with, rather than monitoring all workforce email content. Now, what I mean by this is they could use network data to identify emails that are being sent to competitors or emails that are being sent to a particular recipient that they know is this uh, recipient of this unauthorised data, and then only check the content of those particular emails that they've identified that are going to that recipient or to that competitor. And doing that is going to be far less intrusive. So you'll spot a theme here. If you're always assessing whether there's a less intrusive way of achieving the same aim, you're going to be on the right lines. Now, also, we'll need to be clear about what communications are being monitored and why. So in this context, employees would need to be fully informed about when email monitoring would take place. And there's definitely risks involved with this employee, um, employee email monitoring. And that's because by monitoring these communications, you ultimately are risking damaging the mutual trust between employer and employee. So it really isn't a decision that should be taken lightly. Now, other things to consider include that employee emails could contain special category data. So if you think about it, if you're looking at the content of all of your workforce emails, it's likely that you're going to come across emails that are potentially sent to your HR department or to line managers, which are discussing things like health matters or potentially even emails to trade union representatives. So as well as a lawful basis, you'll need to identify a special category processing condition. And in the context, it is actually going to be quite difficult to do this. So touching on explicit consent again, here this is really unlikely to be appropriate. A, because of the imbalance of bargaining power between employer and employee. So the employee may feel obliged to consent um, to remain in the employer's favour, but also because there's no practical way of asking employees if they consent and then offering them an alternative if they don't. So I think here we can disregard consent as an option which would mean we need to identify an alternative special category processing condition. Now, it's unlikely that the employer's business interests in protecting this commercially sensitive information that it's worried about will alone be sufficient to justify this level of uh, workplace employee um, email monitoring. Whereas you will find that some employers may be subject to regulatory obligations, which actually require it to monitor certain communications. And we often see this, for example, in the um, regulated financial institution space. So whether it's possible to monitor the content of employee emails is going to require a really uh, situation specific assessment. And a key factor is going to be why are you carrying out that monitoring? Now, continuing um, on the same sort of theme, I now wanted to have a look at productivity monitoring software. So again, this is relevant for anybody that's got a workforce that is working sort of from computers or laptops where this productivity monitoring software could be um, deployed. 
And I want to use this example to demonstrate some of the key risks with workplace monitoring. Now, a much higher proportion of workforces are now working remotely, either some of the time or all of the time. So there is greater demand for these productivity monitoring tools. And that's likely because it's much harder for employers to track productivity when people are working at home than say when they're in the office and they're visible. Now, productivity monitoring tools take various different forms, but a couple of key ones are tools which will monitor how long employees spend on certain systems um, and others which log keystrokes so they can see when you're active and online. So if we use the example of an employer that uses a software tool to monitor how long workers spend using a particular system, the employer then uses this data um, about when employees are using that particular system to report on employee performance. Now, this assessment doesn't take into account the reasonable adjustments some workers have, which means that they're actually completing certain tasks outside of this system. Now, unless when the employer reports on this data um, and reports on the performance of the employees, it takes into account that some of this work is being done outside of the system, that reporting and that monitoring is going to be unfair. And it also give, gives rise to a disability discrimination risk. And this is because the reporting wouldn't allow for reasonable adjustments that have been made for employees with, say, certain disabilities. So another final thing to consider here is that if employees are home based, there are going to be challenges with distinguishing between workplace monitoring and private life monitoring. And there's a greater expectation of privacy when someone's working within their private home. So it's really important to tread carefully when you're doing any monitoring which takes place within um, when someone is within their home. Now, moving on to an example of productivity monitoring, which is actually outside of the private home, we've got a real life example um, with Amazon's recent monitoring of its warehouse workers productivity via their handhold scanners. And what they were doing was they were monitoring various different data sets, but one of them was periods of downtime where the particular workers weren't scanning within the factory. Now, as a result, the French privacy regulator, the CANIL, fined Amazon 32 million euros. And the key considerations for the fine were that Amazon was collecting more data than was necessary via these handhold scanners. And also that workers weren't properly informed about the monitoring, so they weren't aware that this was happening. And this really reiterates the importance of A, data minimization, so minimizing the data that you're collecting as a result of the monitoring to only that which is actually necessary and also transparency, so making sure that employees understand how they'll be monitored. Now, just for the final example, I wanted to quickly touch upon CCTV and video surveillance. So often we'll see this used in um, scenarios such as within shops to detect and prevent crime. Also within areas such as machinery in a factory to help monitor areas where there's a particular health and safety risk. Um, as with any other monitoring activities, the same rules apply. So needing to complete a data protection impact assessment and needing to establish a lawful basis and also a special category processing condition if footage may capture special category data. But we've already spoken a lot about data protection impact assessments and lawful basis. So instead for this example, I just want to give a really quick summary of some of the additional things for employers to consider specifically when installing CCTV. So, Think about the placement of cameras. Only put them in areas where there's a particular need for the camera. So for example, shop doors to identify shoplifters leaving. That's much, much more likely to be appropriate and easier to justify than say placing cameras in a staff room where employees go to take their breaks. Making sure you've got clear signage so that employees and customers are aware about where CCTV cameras are located and also providing full privacy notice information to staff. So making sure they're aware of why CCTV is being used and where it's being used. Now, a complimentary document that we would definitely um, sort of highly recommend anybody that has CCTV implementing is a CCTV policy. And this is separate to a privacy notice, but it sets out the specific rules for when footage can be used um, and also things like who can access that footage. And then, that sort of sets out your parameters as an organisation to make sure that your use of CCTV is fair and responsible and falls in line with data protection legislation. Then finally, retention periods and security measures. So retention periods, it's typical for footage to be automatically deleted after say 30 days, which leaves enough time for an instance to come to light and then to be able to retain that particular bit of footage if you need to. Um, 
but in most cases the footage will just be automatically purged at that 30 day point so that you're not keeping footage for any longer than is necessary and security de uh, security measures so that's just going to be limiting access um, password protecting any footage and also viewing it in secure areas so simple things like making sure you're not watching that footage back in public view or in view of other employees who aren't authorized to see it now the ICO has published as we mentioned earlier some guidance on workplace monitoring which is really useful and contains lots of additional worked examples so as well as what we've discussed today that would be a really helpful resource for any employer that's considering workplace monitoring Thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully you found the session useful. And if you do have any queries, I'll leave that slide there with both Rachel and I's email addresses on. Please do feel free to reach out um, and we can pick things up directly.